Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would respond to some YouTube comments and to some patron emails. Let me introduce the podcast. This is the podcast called Psychology in Seattle, and I am your host, Dr. Kirk J. Honda. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm also a professor, core faculty at Antioch University Seattle in the Marriage and Family Therapy Program. Uh, Actually, it's the Couple and Family Therapy Program, but we provide marriage and family therapy degrees. Um, I won't go into the details on why that is, but it's for good reasons. Anyway, so I recently published a episode called Treating Pedophilia, and I've I've had uh, talks about it before, pedophilia and sexual abuse. And it's, uh, it's a hot topic on the internet, which I did not predict I didn't know that the it's it's so interesting to find out what the internet is interested in in terms of um, you know hot topics you know there are things that in my world I would think would be very interesting uh, it's it's very interesting to me it's very interesting to my students but there are some topics that the that the internet because of the demographics and the demographics of people who actually click on things and comment. There are things that uh, are strange that don't represent, I think, the broader public. Um, And I think pedophilia is one of those things. Um, uh, I think because the Internet has has a vocal, very vocal minority of people who are trying to justify having sex with children... Uh, I know how that sounds, and yes, that's what I said. <laughs> there's a there's a very vocal minority of people on the internet who are trying to justify uh, sex with children. They're, they're often not necessarily saying that they've had sex with children because they know what that would uh, you know mean to their lives, but uh, they're kind of saying that. Um, and there's also a vocal group who basically want all pedophiles to be killed there you know that it's like because in the episode in treating pedophilia i was talking with kate stewart and she has a group practice called modern therapy seattle and she wants to help prevent uh, child abuse by working with people who are attracted to children and want to refrain from that and so she wants to uh, be a uh, uh, friendly to those s- groups of people, to those people, so that they can get therapy from a therapist who isn't going to um, kick them out of therapy or report them to the police just because they have an attraction to children. And uh, research shows that when we actually reach out to these folks, we can actually reduce the incidence of abuse. But anyway, so there's a group of people that are be- that are saying like, you know, why do they need treatment? They don't need treatment. That's ridiculous. Or um, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, children want to have sex with adults. So I can prove it. And then there's a whole other group of people that are like, why would you treat these people? That's ridiculous. Um, we should kill them all and that kind of thing. Um, so there's not much of a middle ground that I'm realizing on the Internet anyway, uh, which is why, which I think is actually reflective of our, of our society, which is why our society is doing almost nothing to actually address this issue and why it's also why so very few of these people actually come forward for help. I mean, I, I would just guess, you know, less than a percent percentage of these people actually seek help uh, for specifically this issue. Um, so anyway, you can go to the Modern Therapy Seattle website because they're, they're starting to uh, start to work uh, with this population. Um, I don't know if they've actually worked out the details currently as of uh, February 2018, uh, end of February 2018 when I'm recording this. But anyway, one comment on uh, this episode on YouTube I just wanted to read here. The, the person says, I'm curious about the harm of, sex, of, of the sexual act upon minors. Do you think the act itself is inherently harmful, or is it our, soci- our social stigma around sex that causes such grave trauma? Why is sexual abuse so much more traumatic than other types of abuses? Or maybe that's not the case. Uh, and then I would respond to this. I said that, so you're at, so this person is asking, do you think that, uh, you know, when children have sex with adults, it's inherently harmful, or if the social stigma around sex is what causes the trauma? And what I'm, and then what I said was it can be both. 
for for some it's for for many children it's immediately traumatic and scary and damaging uh, children immediately feel hurt and scared and traumatized i mean the thing the thing to realize about trauma is that it's it's scary and if you've never been sexually abused or traumatized it might be hard to particularly if you're a man because you might have have never incurred any kind of energy around this from anyone else um, let alone actual abuse and so um, it's uh, it might be hard to imagine but if you've been through it you know what it's like it's terrifying it is destabilizing it it's terrifying because if if someone is so willing to use you in this way what else are they capable of doing and what else is the rest of the world capable of doing are are other people wanting to do this to me am i you know if if this can happen to me in cuz often sexual abuse is when you're with people you know like you know cousins and uncles and aunts and babysitters and parents and grandparents and uh, friends of the family and coaches and and so the idea goes it's like well if if someone who supposedly loves me and cares about me is capable of doing this then can i really trust anybody and it, and often these people are sanctioned by parents and and other caregivers and so the you know it's like well you know, if, if this can happen right under the nose of my parents, then what does this mean exactly to my life? And and I, you know, I'm I'm terrified. And and you know, a, a lot of people will uh, report stuff like that. It's just really horrible. And I'm guessing if this has happened to you, that you might even be right now feeling some of that distress just thinking about it. I, I'm feeling some distress talking about it because of of all the work that I've done with clients around this. I mean, it's, it's such a common thing that people come into therapy for as adults. They'll just be like, so I was abused as a kid and I, I've never told anyone and um, it's been affecting my entire life and I've had a, you know, a lot of trouble with sex and a lot of trouble with relationships and a lot of trouble with my self-esteem and, and everything. And so I, I, you know, I'm 45 and I finally want help with that. I want, you know, I want to, I don't know what therapy can do, but you know, blah, blah, blah. And, um, listen to my episode on trauma therapy. If you want to know my approach to that, cause it's very, it's somewhat complicated and, and I've learned a lot from my early uh, practice, but anyway, so yeah, I mean, some people immediately experience it as traumatic and, and damaging. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> for others, yeah, sure. Uh, there are some children who will experience the sexual abuse not as immediately harmful. They will uh, they will report that they felt confused, or that it was weird, or they may they might have even felt special because that you know, you know their uncle who they looked up to was paying attention to them, or the older kid in the neighborhood was paying attention to them, and they felt ooh you know I, I feel special. So yeah, there can absolutely be "quote unquote" positive feelings associated with these events, and then and then later when they realize that it was um, "quote unquote" sexual abuse, then then uh, another trauma occurs where they're basically like, "Well, wait a second. So I was I was sexually exploited when I was seven years old. That's awful. Like, how scary is that? That I was preyed upon, and I didn't even really know it. W- I was being preyed upon. So, um. You know that that can be when the trauma begins for some people. Uh, a lot of people will report that who have been abused. They'll they'll say, well, there there was the original harm that I had as a child, and then there was the second harm I had when I realized uh, what it meant as an older person, and I and I had sort of uh, it, you know incorporated all the social stigma around sex and all this kind of stuff. And and as a as a you know fourteen year old when I was looking back on it, I thought, man, what a I just felt really terrible about it again, and that was another kind of trauma around it. And so, so for sure. Um, but uh, you know, to say that some kids actually, um, you know, are when they're abused in this way, it it's without harm is empirically wrong. Um, I've never seen a case where a child. Uh, you know, so say you take a child who experienced a, tra- a sexual, sexually traumatic event, and didn't cons- didn't really feel scared or didn't really feel 
hurt or you know this kind of thing and um and uh you know i've never seen a case where the kid was like yeah it was no big deal you know you know the adults looking back and they're like yeah you know no big deal you know just just one of those things uh, and and you know how much of that is social stigma how much of that is um just inherently harmful you know because children can't under they don't understand stuff like that and um anyway so uh I'm not really being super articulate because I didn't really prepare for this. But um, but anyway, so the person re- replied back to me, and they, they said, um, thanks for the reply. I saw someone arguing that children can actually enjoy the sexual acts with adults, and it's only abuse because of the moral stigma. How do we discern abusive behavior from normal ones? And then I replied uh, basically that... Uh, the the wording that this person is using normal ones uh, is um, you know a bit of a false dichotomy. I can't remember the exact logical fallacy here, but um, you know d- we have abusive behavior, which we can all agree that children having sex with adults um, in uh, in the vast majority, if not all, the cases we you know is abusive under the definition of abuse that we have. Um, and on the other hand, we don't have normal ones. We, we have less abusive or um, an anomalously neutral, I suppose, um, possibly. But, but, you know, what this person is saying is, um, you know, how, how can we discern between the situations where the children were abused or not abused and what I basically said was, uh, we can't discern them, you know, uh, and it, it's stupid to try, <laughs> you know, why, why do we want to discern between, you know, sexual abuse with sexual acts with children, between adults and children, that is, um, a, you know, less abusive than more abusive. It's like, why does it matter? It's sort of like saying in, in my profession, uh, you know, you know, sometimes having sex with clients is is a good thing, right? Sometimes it, it can go well. Well, what we say in our profession is, well, don't you know, don't roll the dice. You know, I mean, the vast majority of of the time, research shows that when a client has sex with their therapist, it's harmful to the, to the client, and um, and these are adults. So, anyway. Um, so the thing that I wrote, and I know this is a bit of an exaggeration, um, but but to me, not really. I, I, I said, well, it'd be like saying, you know, <clears throat> you know, in terms of how do we discern the difference and and blah blah blah. It's like, well, s- some people might actually enjoy being killed because they're suicidal and they're having trouble getting up the courage to actually kill themselves. So it's okay for a murderer to walk around just randomly shooting people in the face. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's not exactly what I wrote, but that's that's what I meant. It's just like, you know, it. There are extremely rare cases where a murderer will randomly kill someone who <clears throat> really wanted to kill themselves, and of course, we can debate um, the morality of "quote unquote" allowing someone to kill themselves. But, but you know, there are people walking around who are suicidal and are at that point where they really want to do it, and they've been that way for a long time. And uh, they'd be like saying, well, um, you know, so a murderer can walk around shooting people because, you know, some of them want to die. So, you know, my, you know, da, 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 da. It's just like, well, <laughs> you know, uh, the, uh, so what, you know, should, how do we discern the difference between uh, consensual murder and otherwise? It's like, um, no, let's just not do that. How about that? Uh, it's the same with sexual abuse, you know, on the off chance that like, one out of a billion cases, a child is not actually damaged by the act, um, then, uh, you know, we should try to discern or try to figure out the signs. It's like, no, how about we just avoid involving children in sexual activity altogether with adults? You know, how about we just, how about we just do that? Um, Plus, the argument that, well, it's just because of social stigma, and, and that's why children suffer, um, you know, it, it's as I've talked about in other episodes. It's it, it's really hard to tease out society from inherent reactions and stuff because 
uh, it's just impossible because we all grow up in a society. And so if, if it is society, uh, let's say a majority of the reason why sexual abuse is harmful is because of society. There's no way to know the answer to that question, but let's say that, that it is. Well, okay, so what? We can't change society. And so until we actually do and, and actually can figure out how much society is involved and then somehow socially engineer our society to be less stigmatizing around sex in general, particularly sexual abuse, um, until we actually do that, then there, why, you know, it it's, doesn't matter is the point. You know, just, just because it's social stigma um, doesn't mean that um, we should uh, allow it to happen. And I know, again, the, the, the people who are promoting the idea of having sex with children will say like, well, you know, um, when homosexual, you know, people, gay, gay youth, gay teenagers um, are often very um, busted up on the inside about their sexuality and that's society's fault, it's not their fault. And it's like, okay, um, I, get, I get that you see that as analogous, but, you know, we're talking about consenting adults. We're talking about, or consenting people who are of consenting age, shall we say. Anyway, <clears throat> so, um, and sure, you know, like I said, if our society was less screwed up about sex, the negative effects would be reduced for sure. Um, you know, the shame and stigma in our society about sex is strong, particularly around sexual abuse. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's pretty complicated. Um, but, but yeah, st- stigma is a, huge, is a huge problem, and that's our fault. I mean, the thing that I, I often will sort of point to as an analogy is imagine this. You, you have a seven-year-old child who is sexually abused, raped by her uncle. There's, there's just one incident. Um, it's a horrible incident, but it's one incident. And, you know, imagine the lifetime of stigma about that for that girl as she grows into adolescence, young adulthood, adulthood. In my experience, she will probably tell one or two people at most about this in her entire life on average. Um, so, you know, because of the stigma to some extent. Uh, now take the same seven-year-old and she is beat by her uncle. You know, the, the uncle gets drunk and just, just beats her, beats her bad, you know, doesn't kill her, but is, you know, very violent for, you know, five, ten minutes. She survives, and she survives, and she doesn't have any broken bones, but she's really bruised, and she's really hurt. Well, how long do you think she'll keep that a secret? Do you think she'll only tell one or two people in her entire life? No. In all likelihood, she will immediately tell her family, and she'll have no problem telling whoever asks her about it especially when she's an adult, you know, she, as an adult, she'd be like, yeah, one time my drunk uncle just got drunk and lost his temper and, and completely beat me. It was, it was horrible. It was, you know, it was ridiculous. He just, he, I, I didn't do anything and he just targeted me. And so, so you can imagine that, right? You know, both, now it's hard to uh, draw an exact analogy between being beat and being raped, but I hope you get my point is like the reason why people don't, uh, feel that it's um, okay, so to speak, or safe to reveal these uh, moments to people is because our society is constantly, uh, you know, or frequently, is is giving messages, it's very subtle messages. Because it's never that you're a child and someone comes to you and says. If you're ever sexually abused, I want you to keep that to yourself because there's something wrong with you. You know that 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 message is never explicit, but there are a lot of subtle messages uh, towards everyone, including children, that anything involving your private parts is shameful and your fault, and you you're disgust. It's disgusting. It's just a disgusting, gross topic. Your your privates are gross. You are gross. And particularly, uh, girls are, are told that, and you need to, you know, go to go. This is a private matter, and you do not talk about it. You don't share about it, and that's it. I mean, that's America is particularly bad because when you go to Japan, you see that bidets are are all over the place. These these toilets that um, are, and anyone who goes to Japan will, if, if with an open mind, will just be like, oh my god. These these Japanese uh, toilets that you know wash your ass after you go number two. These are glorious machines, and why don't we have them in America? Well, it's not like America is in the dark ages with technology, right? <laughs> We're at the cutting edge of technology, um, and you know we love to have new things and new gadgets. Um, and why are bidets 
uh, I, I'm guessing 20, 30 years from now, it'll start maybe getting, you know, catching on. The reason is, is because our society is so phobic about anything involving the underwear area. And bidets involve the underwear area. And we've just had, you know, from a very young age, we've, you know, our puritanical society has basically just shamed everything south of the border and, you know, made everyone feel ashamed of it. And then, to be, and then uh, any sort of product or acknowledgement about it is somehow seen as disgusting and low class. And, I mean, because as a Japanese person myself, I, I have a bidet and, uh, and we'll talk about it sometimes, you know, I'll just be like, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just go off about it. I'll just be like, you know, the thing that I always say is if you got some of your own poo on your elbow, would you just wipe it off with tissue paper? No, you're, no one's, if you got some, you know, say you got some poo on your fingers or something, right? Like, you're not going to just rinse it. Uh, you're not going to just take, um, you know, uh, toilet paper and wipe it off. You're going to wash your hands, right? You're going to get, get some water on that stuff. Well, why why don't we do that with our butts? <laughs> um, because our society is so stupid. We're stupid. So in conclusion, um, there are people on the internet who are trying to justify their sexual abusive behavior towards children. There are also people on the internet who want all pedophiles to be killed. Uh, as a society, we're doing next to nothing to help the perpetrators or the victims, aside from reacting after the abuse happens, because our society is stupid about sex, our society is stupid about sexual abuse, and our society is stupid about mental health. But some people are trying to do something about it, like Kate Stewart at Modern Therapy Seattle. Okay, let's go on to another email here. Okay, this email is from patron Kate. She writes, Hey, Dr. Kirk, have you done an episode on Big Little Lies? Nicole Kidman's character is in an abusive relationship, and she and her husband enter into couples therapy. She goes to a session meant for the two of them when he is out of town and reluctantly reveals the abuse. So she's saying that uh, Nicole Kidman's character uh, goes to a couples therapy session even though he's out of town and arrives by herself and then reluctantly reviews, reveals the uh, intimate partner violence that Nicole Kidman's character is, is experiencing to the couple's therapist. Uh, patron Kay goes on to say, I'm in my fourth year of grad school for clinical psych, but have yet to learn how you would handle this kind of situation. The therapist in the TV show tells her it's time for another appointment to make a plan to leave the relationship. I'm curious about the ethics when it's the couple in therapy and not the individual. Obviously, everyone's safety is is most important. How would you proceed in a situation like this? Yeah, these are good questions, and I often get asked this sort of thing, and, and it is a bit of a nuanced area, but I tend to approach it in a very uh, concrete way because I don't want to have to uh, lie awake worrying at night if I'm doing the right thing. So, um, so there's a lot of things I can say about this. Um, I, yeah, I did watch Big Little Lies, sort of. I, I, I would sort of see bits and pieces as, as the season went on. And I did see some of the therapy involved. There's, I remember there was couples therapy with Nicole Kidman and her husband, and there was also uh, family and child therapy with um, Woodley's uh, kid. And... Uh, the bits that I saw were um, not great. Uh, although, on the scale of therapy, I would say that's depicted in the in TV show and movies. I would say that it's it's definitely toward the good end of the spectrum. I mean, it's not like the therapists were having sex with their clients, which is like a majority of the time. The therapists are in movies and TV; they're having sex with their clients, or they want to have sex with their clients. And it's like, yeah, that happens for sure, but it's pretty rare. And um, you know, I think Hollywood just has this uh, obsession with a fetish between therapists and clients having sex. It's just bizarre. But anyway, um, so, I mean, just imagine, you know, <laughs> that you're prof whatever you are, you know, say you work at Amazon or you're a plumber or, 
you're a waiter at a restaurant or something. Imagine that 90% of the time your job is depicted in movies and TV, they end up having sex with the customers. <laughs> like, like just imagine that. It's just like, yep. Oh, a plumber. You know, whenever I see a therapist that enters into a TV show or movie, I'm like, oh, you know, when are they going to start having sex with their client? <laughs> like, when is that going to start happening? Imagine, imagine that was your profession. You know, do you think you'd get a little bothered by that? Well, that's me. Um, I mean, people, you know, disrespect us and think we're ridiculous enough as it is. So we don't need that um, hanging over our heads. But anyway, um, so uh, the therapy that I saw, I, I would say that it um, was so. And so I didn't do a full survey of every single moment, but the little bit that I did remember seeing, I remember thinking that both the therapists were not great. Um, the couples therapist, uh, which I'll get into in terms of the ethics regarding meeting alone with uh, one member, she basically, when she does get Nicole Kidman alone, she basically becomes extremely pressuring to Nicole Kidman's character to leave her uh, abusive husband. It's, it's a classic therapist mistake to make. And I've seen it a lot, so it's not like inaccurate. I would say it's probably so. The way they depicted it, it's a it's an accurate depiction of a common mistake that therapists make. But I want to tell you that um, you know, patron Kate, as a clinical psych student, do not follow in either of these therapists' footsteps. Um, you know, the couples therapist uh, meeting with Nicole. So so say you are as a therapist, you learn from your client that they are being abused by their spouse and uh you know and they somehow reveal that well if you watch the sessions with nicole kidman she's not ready to she, she's barely ready to talk about it let alone leave her husband and it's a it's a, a very ignorant almost abusive act for a therapist to become very pressuring and the way that this therapist is badgering Nicole Kidman's character you could almost consider it an inducement of projective identification from Nicole Kidman's character to the to the therapist to produce countertransference that the therapist then enacts a form of sort of therapy abuse in which the therapist is now controlling the client the therapist is like you need to leave and this needs to happen now, and you got to do it today, and here's what you have to do, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, one, even if the client is on board with that, there are safety concerns that are um, important to get in place. You got to have a plan. You got, they have to be connected. You know, you, even, if a, even when a client has come to me and said, I want to extract myself, let's, you know, let's make a plan, it can take months before they can actually take the, take the plunge because you got to get set up with shelters. Money has to be worked out. Family members have to be informed. You know, uh, they've got to get. You know, their their kids have to be often um, figured out. You know, because because there's real concern that the abusive spouse might actually react violently and maybe even kill people. So there. There have to be, you know, this is a very careful process. It's not just like, you know, packing up your stuff and leaving. Um, you know, sometimes that's the best action, but sometimes it's not. And, and as a therapist, you definitely don't want to, like, uh, claim to know the right path here. You're, you're a therapist. You're not a, you're not a coach. You're a healer. You're a listener. You're an explorer. You're not a director. You're not a parent. You're not a police officer. You're not even a domestic violence advocate. You are a therapist, and that is your role, and that is a very um, limited role that you should stick to, uh, professionally speaking. I mean, the thing I always tell my, my students when stuff like this happens in, in situations like this is, at what point in your graduate training program did someone tell you that you should pressure your clients to leave their spouses if they're in an abusive relationship? What class taught you that? What, you know, was there a class titled um, how to pressure your clients to leave their abusive husbands, uh, you know, 401? Uh, you, and, and they're like, uh, yeah, never. And I'm like, well, why do you think that is? And, and therefore, why do you think it's okay to do this? And where did you learn this? Well, where you learned it from was society and Dr. Phil and, uh, you know, Jerry Springer. That's where you learned it. You, you learned it in, in, the, in the graduate school of TV. 
and you need to really differentiate that. You know, that's what culture has taught you, not what your graduate training program taught you. No domestic violence advocate would act this way. No one would pressure. Domestic violence advocate, good ones, do not pressure people. They explore it with people. They care, and they probably know that leaving the abusive spouse is the right answer, but they they know that the victim uh, ne- needs time to adjust. They're basically, they've basically been beaten into a cult-like situation where they have done a lot of mental tricks to justify staying because they feel trapped. And it takes a while to change one's mind, you know, and, and if you're the only person that they're talking about this with, which is likely, then you got to hold on to that connection, which means that you've got to, you know, go to your own therapy and counseling and your own consultation to deal with your counter-transference regarding uh, your extreme need for this person to leave their spouse. So uh, so the couple's therapist who meets individually with Nicole Kidman, in my estimation, was terrible. It was a, it was a very massive misunderstanding of what it's like to be abused and, and what it is to actually help someone in a situation like this. I have personally worked with abused spouses for years as they contemplate leaving. And and the entire time, my counter-transference is screaming at the person saying, you have to leave. This person is a monster. You have to leave. But I know better because I've made that mistake in my early career. I'd be like, uh, you know, I'd, I'd get real sort of... Um, it because to me on the outside it just seems obvious it's like well obviously you're going to leave right especially when the when the victim starts talking like they're not in love with that person anymore and and they've wanted to leave for a long time you know just okay well you know let's do it and then by the fifth session i'm starting you know in my early career i'd get upset i'd be like why don't why haven't you left yet i'd have this attitude of just like what's wrong with you <laughs> you haven't haven't you left and you know it just is this massive misunderstanding and lack of empathy for what it's like to actually be in an abusive relationship. The other therapist, the family, the family uh, child therapist, um, th- I remember a moment that I also hated, which was the therapist, although, you know, for the most part is behaving, uh, you know, professionally and all this kind of stuff, and perhaps with a lot of caring, the therapist says, to the mother, the Woodley uh, character, uh, she, um, I think her name is Woodley, right? Um, the uh, she, the therapist. So uh, the the mother brings in the child because the child has been accused of bullying, and the therapist does some kind of evaluation, and then the therapist meets with the mom alone and says, "Your your child isn't bullying." There, I know for a fact that your child has not bullied other kids at school. In fact, he doesn't even have the personality for bullying other kids. He's not narcissistic. He's not this. He's not that. And so I know for a fact that whoever accused him of bullying is wrong, and I know that. And that's ridiculous. <laughs> there is no way for a therapist to know the answer to that. And again, it, it's it's a frequent counter-transference that, that therapists will have. So let's say you have a legitimate kid who's bullying other kids at school. Well, our, you know, cartoonish vision of what a bully is, is some kind of monster, right? But, you know, often they're, they're hurting, they're suffering kids, and they're expressing their suffering through bullying of other kids. And so you bring that kid into therapy. And then the therapist sits down alone with the kid in a controlled environment and plays with the kid, play therapy, you know, plays games, draws pictures, uh, sand tray, this kind of stuff. And the kid doesn't exhibit any hostility or any anger or any bullying type behaviors while they're in session. And then the therapist is like, this is ridiculous. This kid isn't a bully. This kid doesn't match my uh, template, my cartoon template of what a bully looks like. And there's no way this kid is bullying. And then the therapist starts to get this narrative in their mind that the, the school administration is ridiculous and these other parents are ridiculous. And if anything, this kid's being bullied himself. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight this school and I'm going to tell the mom that whoever's a, you know, doing this is ridiculous. This is a very common counter-transference that therapists have because you, when you identify with kids, you don't you you lose your 
uh, self-identity and you lose your objective reality and you you want to believe that your kid that your kid and this kid won't wouldn't abuse someone it's the same with parents right you know when a when a when a kid gets abu- accused of bullying their parents will defend them they'll be like no my my kid would never do that well it you know it's a normal reaction in some ways you kind of want parents who are like that um, within reason, right? And so therapists are prone to the same countertransference. But uh, but I'm here to tell you that um, you know bullies, you know, or quote unquote kids kids who bully, when they go to therapy, they may they might not exhibit that behavior. Plus, bullying can be a lot of different things, right? Um, anyway, so this therapist, without without ever talking apparently with anyone at school, just just meets with the kid maybe once maybe even just for half a session, I don't remember, but not for a long time, comes to the mother and, and just fuels the fire, really, by saying it's ridiculous this kid isn't a bully. Now, again, uh, is an accurate depiction of a frequent mistake that therapists will make. Um, but so so both of these... Uh, now, of, of course, it's a TV show, so they need the plot to move forward, and they're using these therapists as sort of outside forces to help move the plot forward. It's a, it's a common writing technique where it's just like you create a crisis. Um, one crisis is Nicole Kidman's domestic violence situation. The other crisis is uh, the, the Woodley mom and her kid being accused of, of being outsiders and bad in the community and this kind of stuff. And so the therapists come along and sort of uh, shine. They're sort of like the Obi-Wan Kenobis. You know, they're, they're the ones that say... Um, here's what needs to happen, and here's what you need to do. They sort of put pressure on the crisis in order to move the plot forward. I get that. But at the same time, the depictions should not be revered as good therapy. These are these are not good therapists. And I, it drives me crazy because a lot of my supervisees engage in this kind of behavior. And again, what I say is um, about, you know, if someone did this about, about an evaluation of bullying, I'll say, uh, in graduate school, what class did you take that that gave you the notion that you would have the ability to know what a child is doing in school? You know, what class had a chapter in a book or a module that taught you ways of detecting children's behavior outside of your office? Uh, you know, was there ever a notion in any theory, in any therapy technique or any kind of assessment technique that that told did the professor ever tell you that you would have the ability in session to play games with a kid and know firmly what that kid did at school the previous week no you've never taken a class on that there's never been a book on that and the reason is is because if there ever was it would immediately get thrown into a fire because everyone knows that that's not science that's not empirical it's not um, it's not good professionalism for, for, for one and two it's there's no way you can meet with a kid alone in session and know what they are doing in school you can make some guesses for sure you could say oh, you know he doesn't seem like a bully but you know what do I know and that's the thing you always have to tell yourself as a as a therapist working with kids it's just like I, I have no in this context the kid is doing this and that but I really just have no idea I like the kid and I would like to think that the kid didn't do these kinds of things but as I know that countertransference is real and I'm going to be biased towards this kid uh, let's take a break and continue talking about this <music> All right, we're back from the break. We have locked down the 10-year anniversary live show for August 2018. It's August 11, Saturday, August 11. Uh, not sure on the time yet, so if you're wanting to save the date, August 11, probably the afternoon, uh, 2018, 10-year uh, 10 10 year live show. Also, if you haven't become a patron of the podcast, do so now. Go to patreon.com. That's the best way you can support us. Again, August 11, 2018, and Patreon. Okay, so to continue this conversation, um, you're asking, uh, uh, well, so, so just to wrap up the um, uh, talk about these, these two therapists, I'll say that they exhibit uh, a common mistake that therapists make in which they basically become extremely pushy and and honestly, it's the way I used to see therapy. Uh, when I when I was 
24, 25, and decided I wanted to be a therapist. This is the sort of therapy, if I had seen it on TV, that I would have evaluated as good therapy. I would have been like, whoa, that's the kind of therapist I want to be. Because, you know, we all want to be able to yell at people, and we all want to be able to tell people what to do, and we all think we know what's right. Well, if, if it's one thing that 20 plus years of being a therapist has taught me is I don't know anything. I don't know anything about what's right. There have been people who have been in abusive relationships, very toxic abusive relationships, in which I, as a, as a human being observing this with my clients, would say, man, you got to leave this person. This is awful. And I'm, a, I'm 110% sure of that. And uh, through my exploration work and uh, through the client's work and through the uh, abusive spouse's work, uh, five years later, the couple is still together and the abuse has been has ended long ago and they've recovered and they've built a, a wonderful marriage. So, you know, what do I know? <laughs> Uh, and and why do I want to know? And why do I think I know? And why do I think it's, why am I so arrogant that I would possibly think I would know the right path for another human being? I barely know my own path. Uh, you know, how do I, you know, and, and at the very least, how do I know that it's the right path at the right pace? You know, think about all the times you've been, uh, you, you've talked with friends about a relationship that you're in. Think about all the times that you've just been annoyed with how how annoyed they get with you. You know, they'll just be like, I don't understand why you're with this guy. You know, like, what's wrong with you? That you're, you're Why are you with this guy? Well, you know, why are you still with that woman? Like, geez, you know, and it, it hurts. It hurts your feelings. And, and, and you might not know why you're still there. And all you know is you're not ready to go. That's all you know. And, and you know you need someone to be able to be there with you and listen to you and not judge you. Uh, and what's it to them? You know, what's it to you? <laughs> it's a thing. It's like, why do you, you know, why are you so pissed off and so pressury and so pushy about it? It's just so pushy. It's, you know, anyway. Um, again, very common mistake that therapists make, and I find myself um, confronting my supervisees on this frequently. Um, I, and sometimes it's the same supervisee that I will confront this on over and over and over again. Um now, having said that, uh, yes, uh, there's a spectrum of taking on a responsibility regarding domestic violence that people will take. So, so some, so some people will say, um, "I when I see abuse happen, I'm gonna I'm gonna attack it because it's unfair," and that's totally valid. Other therapists will say, like, "Well, you know, if people ask me for help with it, I absolutely will help them with it, but I'm not gonna go looking for it." So there, there's a, there's a there's a wide variety of approaches to uh, violence between adults. You know, Ch- child abuse. There's a there's a mandate that we have to um, do something. But anyway, for for intimate partner violence be- between spouses, it, there's there's different approaches to how vigilant you are in terms of attacking the problem. Um, and and when there is someone who was being victimized they often will need someone outside of them to guide them in terms of helping them to understand that they are entitled to not be abused because they might have been abused their entire life. At the very least, they've been abused as an adult for a while, and you start to believe that you deserve it, and you start, you start to believe that it's the, only, it's the only sort of life that you'll ever live. And they need someone from the outside to say, like, you don't deserve that, and um, there are ways to get out, and there are support systems that can help you. And I'm here to listen, and I'm here to explore, and I'm here to not judge you, and I'm here to be here for you if you stay or if you go. But, but I'm here to tell you that um, I think that you're being abused, and I think that's unfair to you, and I think you deserve better. Um, so you can absolutely have those kinds of messages, for sure, and you should. But to say, like, the way that this therapist does in Big Little Lies, it's like, you're leaving tomorrow. Tomorrow, you're going to do this. And if you don't, um, I reject you. <laughs> you know, it's just like, come on. Um, now, you ask another question, uh, patron Kate, how, how to react when couples arrive um, as a single person? So in my experience, anecdotally, most therapists do nothing. And in my, in my early career, I did nothing too. I, I would just be like, oh, um, one of the spouses showed up and, you know, you know, and Nicole Kidman shows up and says, like, oh, well, you know, my husband's out of town. So I, I thought I'd show up by myself. 
you know, most therapists do nothing, but it's a massive open door to legal problems and complaint problems, particularly if the couple is headed towards legal problems, which this couple is, you know, the therapist knows that the client is, you know, potentially heading towards divorce. And if they're, if you're doing, if, if there's a sticky situation like that and um, a single shows up from a couple, you, you should, you should definitely consider not having that session. But really what needs to happen is this needs to be fully explained in the first session. You know, what I say to people is, so just to let you know, um, I'm, both of you are the client. Both of you have signed my disclosure statement. Both of you have client rights. And if either one of you comes to therapy alone, or either one of you contacts me, or either one of you emails me or calls me, I will inform the other person about what you told me. So, so if you email me, I'm going to email both of you back because I don't want any secrets between any of us regarding any of that kind of stuff. Um, now, uh, because couples will play sort of triangulation games with that, you know, like the, the husband will say, will email and say like, so I just want to let you know that, um, you know, I don't know, uh, my wife is completely crazy and I don't like her. I don't know. I, I can't remember exact. There's, there's better examples than that, but, but it happens sometimes. And, and therapists get really caught in this weird bind. And it's just, you know, if you just explain it up front, like this is, if you email me, I'm going to email both of you. And it could even be in your disclosure statement. If, if one of you shows up to therapy by themselves and the other person hasn't consented to that over, you know, the phone or over email or something, then I'm just going to turn you away. It's just, I just really want to uphold the sanctity of the two of you. And I don't want there to be any uh, games being played. And, and if you say that up front clearly, then you just follow that policy. Um, now, having said that, there's nothing wrong with meeting with one partner in a couple. I do it all the time. Uh, it, but it just has to be clear in the treatment plan and it has to be uh, consented to after you inform them about the pros and cons to that. And, and it's something that a lot of therapists, in my experience, don't do, mostly because they don't know that they should and they don't know the pitfalls of not. And, um, and they don't know how. I, I've, I've, just seen, I've worked with a lot of experienced therapists, therapists 20 years into the profession who who just are shy about all this kind of stuff. They just don't know what to say. And I'm like, well, let me demonstrate. Let me role play exactly what you say. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, because because in their training program, it just didn't come up or they don't remember it or something. And so, you know, anytime you're, you're, you're anytime there's a treatment plan, you have to be explicit about it. And there, so it, you, in the first session, you would say, so I like to meet alone with my couples and families. Uh, I like to have individual sessions sometimes for various different reasons. And there are pros and cons to that. You know, here are the pros, here are the cons. What do you guys think of that? And they're like, yeah, sure, let's, let's do that. Okay, so, they, so you document that you, you know, gave the pros and the cons for the, for the treatment plan, and they consented, and then you're good to go. But without that conversation, without that documentation, it's a, it's a wide open door to a lawsuit. You know, for example, a couple, you're working with a couple, a woman arrives alone like Nicole Kidman. She, rev she reveals her that, you know, sh sh her true feelings uh, that she wants to leave or that she's being, uh, you know, abused in some way. And the therapist encourages her to leave and the wife leaves, she divorces. And then the husband now uh, is upset. The husband is angry at you as a therapist. And whenever you have a client who's angry at you, they start looking for a, um, they, they start trying to find ammo that they can get you with. And when they come across this uh, treatment anomaly in which you met alone with his wife for a couple sessions, he'll, he'll start consulting with lawyers and ethics experts to see if, if he can sue you for it. And he can if you didn't have uh, conversations about the change of treatment plan or about the informed consent, then, you know, he has grounds. And so he could say, look, the therapist changed the treatment plan and just, just, you know, arbitrarily change it to individual therapy without talking with me first. And he would have a valid legal uh, complaint, not only against your license, but also in civil court to sue you. And, um, you know, uh, and that, that sort of thing can be upheld with uh, licensing boards and with civil suits. And all of that would have been avoided if you just, in your 
you know, disclosure statement and verbally in the first session, you just explained what you do and then, and then you just do it. And, or if uh, someone does arrive alone and you haven't talked about it, you're like, I'm sorry, I can't meet alone with you because I, I don't have consent from the other client in this system that, that the treatment plan can be changed in this way. And, the, the, you know, this just drives me crazy about my supervisees, honestly, and really just about therapists in general. It's like, we're not friends with our clients. We're not just a, we're not just like someone, you know, we're not just like uh, someone who just is standing on a corner. We're professionals. We're clinicians who provide a service that is being, that is licensed by the government, that is being paid for by insurance companies. You know, if, if, if we get dragged into court, we have to be able to justify our treatment decisions in that language. Now, you might not like to do that. You might like to be like, well, I don't like to be all professional and like a fuddy-duddy. I, I, like, I like to be kind of loose and kind of natural and, um, you know, sort of um, just like a regular person. I don't like to think about that kind of stuff. Okay, great. If you want to give off that vibe, and I know therapists that are like that. I'm kind of like that. I, I don't like to get all super professional. I mean, um, my office is in my home, for example, because I, I, for a lot of reasons. But um, but one of the things is I, I just don't really care. I don't really care about being super professional. That's fine. But also, you have to know that the law is a part of our lives, and you have to justify your actions. And if, and if push comes to shove and you end up in court, you have to be able to justify your your actions. You have to you have to know what the standard of care is. You have to have provided informed. You have to have, have gotten informed consent, which means you have to inform the client. You have to follow certain protocols. You have to document all that. And when I talk with people about this, they're just like, "Oh my God, this sounds horrible." It's not horrible. It's easy once you know the principles and you get into the habit. It's simple. My life, my paperwork, uh, the amount of time I spend on paperwork is minimal. For each session, I probably spend like ten seconds on paperwork. You know, so so count that up. Uh, you know, if I have if I have six sessions in 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 one day, that's one minute of paperwork that I did for that entire day in private practice. It's probably maybe even a little less than that because I'm very fast. So uh, it's not it doesn't cr- increase labor. It just um, means that you have to spend a little bit time up front getting used to certain habits. But once you once you learn the habit, it's it's easy. Um, you know, there's a lot of habits that you've learned as a therapist, and you know, this is just one of them. And and I have worked with therapists who hire me as an ethics expert, as someone that can help them extract themselves from situations like this or can help them in court. And 99% of the time, nine, maybe 100% of the time, the problems that people come to me with could have been solved if they just would have done stuff like this up front. Just little, little things that they could have done uh, up front and they could have avoided the entire problem. And believe me, if you're a therapist, you know how terrifying it is to be dragged into court being accused of doing something wrong, especially when you have no way of justifying your actions. You have no paperwork. You have no, you, you can't, you know, you don't have a leg to stand on. It's terrifying. You lie awake at night, you know, worrying about losing your license and being humiliated and being called out as, you know, incompetent stuff. It's horrible. So again, we're not friends, we're clinicians. We are, we provide treatment and there needs to be a treatment plan. Now, some of you professionals out there fully know this. I, I know, you know, Simon being one of them, who I talk to sometimes, uh, you know, there are people out there I know who are extremely professional and, and, you know, as I'm saying this stuff, they're just like, yeah, I do that all the time and I commend you for it, um, you know, and you know how wonderful it is to be that way because you don't have anything to worry about. Anyway, so let's go on to another email. Okay, this email is from patron Yoonji. Yoonji writes, Mentalizing versus projection. What is the difference and how do you reliably know you're engaged in one and not the other? So mentalizing versus projecting. This is a very good question. Mentalizing is is the ability to conceive and make good guesses about what is happening in another person's mind. We actually develop this at an at an early age, but there's a time when we're infants and we can't mentalize. And some people who are abused actually 
or have other kinds of issues developmentally, they where it makes it harder for them to do this, or or they have a delayed ability to mentalize. So, for example, when you you know they'll do experiments on kids and they'll they'll have a a ball and they'll put the ball in in a bucket and and then so so they'll you'll have a kid an experimenter and an, a, and a teacher so we say and you put a ball in a bucket and then you turn the bucket upside down so the ball is you know the bucket's on top of the ball and then the researcher says okay teacher leave the room and the teacher leaves the room and then while the teacher is out of the room the researcher takes the ball and puts the ball in their pocket you know in the bucket but puts the bucket back you know uh, you know upside down again and the researcher says teacher come back in and kids who are young you know younger will say so the researcher researcher will say where do you think the teacher thinks the ball is and a younger child will say the teacher thinks the ball is in your pocket and an older kid will say the teacher thinks the ball is in the bucket so I hope you understand what I'm saying here is that, you know, the ability to know that this other person has left the room and therefore doesn't know that you've moved the ball. And when they come back in, they're going to think the ball is in the bucket, which is not true. The ball is not in the bucket. The ball is in the researcher's pocket. So that's the ability to mentalize. Now, that has obvious usefulness in terms of being able to operate in the world, but it also gives you the ability to empathize. It gives you the ability to be in someone else's shoes. It's like, you know, uh, when if you have never been abused, say, sex, if you've never been sexually abused, the you have to the ability to mentalize is the ability to imagine what it would be like to have been sexually abused. Uh, particularly, uh, at, you know, if you listen to people describe. For you, if you've never been sexually abused or sexually threatened at all, which would be hard to believe, you know, uh, given the wide variety of harm that happens to human beings. But, um, but anyway, it, it's, um, you know, if that's never happened to you, it might be really hard for you to imagine what that is. You'd just be like, huh, well, I don't, I think you're exaggerating, you know, <laughs> I think you're making that up. And, and so mentalizing is a, is, a, is a wonderful thing that we have developed as human beings. And, and something that um, is evidence of higher mindedness, right? The, the ability to, to, to know that uh, is, is complicated. Anyway, so, so that's mentalization. And then we have projection, which is, is a you know, defense mechanism from the Freudian times that we still use today in my world. Uh, projection is is basically when we see another person or a thing as possessing an unwanted aspect of ourself. So that's very important to know, and I'm constantly drilling this into my students, is that it has to be an unwanted aspect of yourself, an unwanted feeling, an, un- an unwanted characteristic. That's very important, because when you when you latch onto that part of the definition, it eliminates the confusion to me. But anyway, so, but in the, in the lay public and among a lot of therapists, incidentally, projection is often confused with distorting or displacing. For example, uh, the statement, he seemed really angry, but maybe I was just projecting. Um, or uh, another, you know, if, if you are not actually angry on the inside, um, say, so say you're not angry and you are in a classroom and your teacher, you're starting to feel like you're getting a vibe that your teacher's angry, and you're not angry on the inside. You're you're not secretly angry. There's nothing. You're just you're just normal, and your teacher is is giving off a an angry vibe, and you're like, you know what? He seemed really he seemed like he was angry about something, but maybe I was just projecting. So that is not projecting. That is distorting. There, there's really no defense mechanism for that. It's just like you're misunderstanding something. You're not getting it. <laughs> you're, so that is not projection because if the only way it would be projection is if you were secretly angry and, and suppressing it and you saw anger in your teacher. That'd be the only way for it to be projection, okay? So that's why it's often sort of misunderstood as a, as a distortion or misunderstanding because if projection, if looked at very simply could be reduced to that, but it's not that. It, projection is you are projecting something from you 
that you have, not that you believe someone else has, something that is inside of you and you're projecting it on someone else. And that and the reason why you're projecting it is because you don't like the fact that you have it. So um, another confusion that people will say projection around is that it's being pushy or trying to force people to do something that they don't want to do or be something they, they don't want to be. Like she is projecting her hopes and dreams onto her kids. She is projecting her hopes and dreams onto her kids. Now, some of you might be like, well, what's wrong with that statement? Well, there's nothing wrong with it in the lay public, but there is something wrong with it in the clinical liter. You know, if, if you're if you're in the field and you use that term, you're going to be seen as a hack because you're not using projection correctly. Uh, you you can't pro- you can't project your hopes and dreams because you want your hopes and dreams, right? You you like your hopes and dreams. Uh, you're you're just being pushy. So you would just say she is pushing her hopes and dreams onto her kids. She's not projecting. Now you could make a sort of uh, you know twisted argument to somehow wrap it into projection, but. Uh, I wouldn't use that language. Um, Again, projecting is when we see another person as having something that we have, but we don't like that we have, and it isn't what the other person actually has. (laughs) So, for example, um, when we have impulses that are hostile, we don't like that about ourselves. None, None of us, very few of us like to admit that we have hostile feelings towards other human beings because it goes against most of our super ego's wishes for ourselves. And so we will often project that hostile intent or, or those hostile impulses onto other people and then attack them. So we might look at a politician, say Donald Trump, and and look at him and say like, oh, he's so hostile and aggressive and and he's so mean and stuff. And maybe he is, you know, maybe he is. But he's a he's a very convenient target of projection because it allows people, if they need to, offload their hostile impulses themselves onto someone else. Um, another example of projection is a man is this is a classic one. A man is having having an affair, so he's he's actively cheating, but on the in, and he's not a psychopath, so on the inside, he's actually really busted up about it. He doesn't like the fact that he's cheating, and he's really quite ashamed of it. And he, so his ego says, "Well, how about we just project it on other people, and then you, and then you'll be distracted at the very least, or even best, maybe you won't even notice that you're the one who's doing it." And so, what the ego will do is like, "Well, how about we just start accusing your wife that she's cheating all the time?" So. It's it's a classic projection where a man is having an affair, but he's obsessed with the notion that his wife might be having an affair, and he's like, "You're having an affair, aren't you? You're attracted to other men. Yeah, you know, I saw the way you look at that other man." Blah blah blah. blah. But actually, what's happening is he's the one having an affair, and he doesn't uh, like it. He's very upset about it on the inside. Another example is, you know, it's popular is a gay politician who lives in a conservative community and feels unsafe to actually even explore his own sexuality, sees gay men as a threat to society. So in this way, he's, he's projecting. So he, on the inside, he has a fight that's going on between his, his sexuality and his judgment of it. And so he, he externalizes that in that way. Anyway, it's sort of a projective identification in that sense. But anyway, um, so again, projection in, in the lay public is often mean uh, is often used to mean putting something in some inside someone else's head. But again, that's that's that again is just a distortion or a misunderstanding or something. Um, now it could be a projection uh, if the thing we are putting inside someone he- someone's head is actually something that is a denied part of self. Like I was really insecure at the party. I thought everyone was looking at me, looking at me funny, but I was just projecting. So yeah, you're distorting other people's point of view of you, but it's also a projection because on the inside, you're actually beating yourself up. You're saying you're ridiculous. Everyone thinks you're stupid. And then, um, but you don't like that about yourself. You don't like the fact that you're beating yourself up. So you actually project that into other people and, uh, and see everyone as beating you up when in fact they're not. Now, projective identification is a whole other thing in which I've done several episodes on, but in a nutshell, it's when we actually socialize another person to agree with our projections, and in in doing so, we basically recreate our past relationships. In 
a, an attempt to create comfort and perhaps to create a corrective emotional experience. All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle in which I talked about those things. <laughs> um, let me know what you think. You can email me at contact at psychologyinseattle.com. That's contact at psychologyinseattle.com. Um, I usually respond to every email I get. So if you're um, one of those people who are like, um, I, I'm shy, I don't, you know, I don't want to put myself out there, um, you know, I'm here for you. I, the only reason why I do this is because of you. Uh, if you weren't listening, I would not be doing this. I would be doing something else. So if, if you email me, that is part of the gig that I consider that this gig entails is um, that, um, you know, it, it'd be like if if I was giving a, a lecture or a talk or a presentation and no one showed up or no one had a reaction, then I just wouldn't do it anymore. You know, I'm, I'm not doing this just to hear myself talk. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit narcissistic in that way, but uh, not that narcissistic. So, so you know, uh, it, if when people email me and they they get they're surprised that I care or that I respond, I just have to say like, well, why else would I be doing this if it weren't for some reaction or some interaction with people who are actually listening? I mean that that's the whole reason I'm doing this. So you know, and you're you're part of that. You're worth it. You're you're one of those people who um, has importance to me. So you know, don't. Uh, now, if you don't want to email me, that's fine. You know, I can take a rejection. No, just joking. Um, you know, uh, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is if you want to email and you've been, uh, you know, refraining because you, you don't want to bother me or something, just know that it is the opposite. It actually um, gives my day a little happiness to know that you're out there. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Thanks for joining me. Please take care of yourself and please email if you care to because... We all deserve that.